specialty is uh, getting this up and live. And so the recording from today will be available on the Snohomish Health District Facebook page for one week. So if you know friends who were not able to come today but were interested, you can direct them there and they can presumably click on it and see it. Um, so without further ado, welcome to the July ACES Quarterly. These events, as I mentioned, are sponsored and organized by the Snohomish County NEAR Collaborative. NEAR is an acronym and it stands for Neuroscience, Epigenetics, the Adverse Child Experiences Study, and Resilience. The events function as community learning opportunity and occur every January, April, July, and October. So topics center around the NEAR sciences. <coughs> We do have um, some uh, cards on your table, these sheets for feedback, and we're always looking for um, thoughts on how to improve our offerings. So feel free to leave us comments that way or email us if you're watching remotely. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you um, the Snohomish County Music Project, specifically Victoria and Cassie. We're both here to represent this really amazing project. So the Snohomish County Music Project has been providing music services to the Everett community since 1935, but in 2010, the board of directors of the Everett Symphony undertook its new mission, which I think is the most audacious mission I've ever heard. <laughs> it is to use the power of music to inspire people to do good things for their communities and for themselves. And then they consequently reorganized um, under the name Snohomish County Music Project. So they have since transformed into more of a human services organization, and it's bringing the power of music therapy to Snohomish County by using music as a tool to address community, clinical, and therapeutic goals. And we're lucky in Snohomish County, one of the collaboratives that I work on, which is Homeward House, um, is already going to be availing themselves of these services. So I will let them introduce further um, what the aims of their project are, and um, it looks like we will even be getting a practical demonstration. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Um, do you all have a preference on if we speak directly or if we use a microphone? Does speak anyone? directly, and then if we can't hear you, we'll say please use the mic. Okay, <laughs> what do you think? Sounds good to me. Good for us. Cool. I'm Bea Fansler, um, music therapist with the Snohomish County Music Project. Jesse Fox, same. Yeah. yeah, so we first just want to describe a little bit of our organization, who we are and what we do. Um, so as Sarah described, we're uh, primarily a music therapy uh, services organization right now. And our reach is very broad. So because music therapy is defined by our modality, we end up working with a lot of different people on a lot of different type of, types of goals throughout Snohomish County. Um, but we do have some common threads throughout our services. Um, one of those biggest ones is that we're a trauma-informed organization. So we use a trauma-informed approach regardless of what our sites are, um, regardless of if someone is referred to us you know, due to an acute trauma or specifically because of trauma or not, um, we apply that trauma-informed lens in all of our, uh, in all of our work. Um, another sort of common theme that we have is that we use a systems approach. So we do a lot of individual services to work on individual well-being, but again, in all of our services, that's nested within this awareness that individual health is ecological health um, and that you know, for us to do well as individuals, we need healthy relationships and we need a healthy community. Um, so because of that, we have a, a lot of intersections of individual music therapy services and community music therapy services. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, do you want to talk about some specifics? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I had this in my head for later. <laughs> so give me a moment to orient myself. Um, so, I, starting with community music therapy. Um, oh, just focus. Okay. <laughs> um, so, some of the people.
people that we serve, we work with, um, we work with young children and their families. Um, we work in a detention center and with adjudicated youth. Um, we have like group music classes um, to work with um, youth that are affected by environmental traumas. Um, we work with elders affected by dementia and their caregivers. Um, we work with veterans. Um, we work with a wide variety. We work in schools. We work with people with developmental disabilities. Yeah. Um, so yeah, our reach our reach is very broad. Again, and because we know that music therapy can do a lot of things for our brains and for our relationships, and so uh, yeah, we're applying that uh, throughout our site. And you can see here; these are all um, pictures from our actual sessions. So we have a rock band here that is partly funded by uh, the Department of uh, the Developmental Disabilities Administration. So we have a, a group gathering for the rock band practice. Um, we have some people playing, I think, at our camp. Yeah. So the the music classes that we have during the summer, we actually have a music camp that meets for like six to eight Saturdays during the summer, mm -hmm. um, and we feature different musical workshops during that. So we have some elementary kids playing music in that sort of camp uh, program. Um, we have a veteran playing in a group jam. And we have this tiny picture is from our memory cafe, which is for elders with dementia and their caregivers. And that's at our location uh, at Pacific and Wetmore uh, once a month. And, and people come and eat together and talk and also have a music therapy session with Okay, so we've been asked to talk about, oh yeah, go ahead. Is there a charge for your services? And if there is, does um, Apple Health cover that? That's a great question. So our, we have a lot of different funding streams that support our services. Much of our work is funded by third party grants. Um, we do have sliding scale services, we have private pay services, and then we contract with organizations. There are some insurance companies that fund some music therapy work, but I don't know the details of those things because I don't do that part. Yeah, and there will be an email address at the end of the slide that's just like a general information that will go to an administrative staff that could tell you that specifically. Mm -hmm. okay. Victoria, Kathy, Cassie, I'm sorry. Uh, you might want to repeat the question because she's in the front, so some of us in the back can't hear quite as well. Sure. Before you yeah. Answer that yeah, yeah. yeah, so that question was just about what our, how we fund uh, those things if there's a charge for services and what insurance looks like with that. Um, yeah, so we'll be talking about trauma with music and trauma for adults, but within that, we really wanna challenge ourselves to expand our notions of, when we're talking about ACEs, like what tends to be our picture and who else is maybe impacted by ACEs and is sometimes left out of these conversations. So in considering adults, I want you to first think to yourself in whatever your work is, when we're talking about ACEs, these adverse childhood experiences, what is the image of a person impacted by these that you have? So take a moment and picture that for yourself in your work. Yeah, adverse childhood experiences. And I'm gonna give what I think based on Google images <laughs> and sort of my experience is what I think can be some of our common assumptions, which is that we're talking about children and often that we're talking about children who are impacted by these family traumas like abuse and neglect, but who otherwise have some aspects of protection or privilege, uh, such as being potentially white, like in this picture and all of the pictures of actual children that come up in image searches of ACEs. Uh, non-disabled, uh, maybe middle class, you know, so we have these intersections of when we're talking about ACEs as if they're in a vacuum, what that might look like. Um, but, and we're often talking about children, so a lot of these presentations are talking about families with young children, but the sort of point of the ACEs study is that those children grow up into adults who still carry that complex trauma. And so we want to be aware of that, you know, in our work sort of with this breadth of reach. 
So this question is, what's not covered within the ACES questionnaire? So to give just some quick background, uh, I know a lot of you probably spend quite a bit of time talking about ACEs already, but this study was done with Kaiser Permanente, so it was a private insurance company. Um, I think that 80% of the participants in the original study were white. Um, private insurance tells us some things about class uh, related to that, and that the average age of participants in the original ACEs study was 56. So when we talk about the ways that ACEs impact the lifespan, we already are drawn even from a sample of people who had lived beyond some of those points that we have concerns and risks related to. So ACEs covers you know, abuse and neglect as it impacts us with those other sort of privileges and protections, but we know that ACEs are also, and trauma in general, is also linked to these other aspects of identity. So, um, the ACEs study has some assumptions that, you know, children are growing up in a nuclear family with the same two parent caregivers, and that if something happens with one of those parents, it will impact them. But we may have kids who grow up with their grandparents or move between different family systems who may be just as impacted by a trauma related to their auntie or their grandparent as they would be by a parent. Um, we may have, we may know people who, uh, due to disability, have other caretakers that are not family or that are not parents, and where that level of intimate relationship and dependence and reliance is similar or can have the same impact if, if uh, there are traumas that happen within those relationships. And we know that, you know, like, people with disabilities are much more at risk for some of the types of trauma that the ACEs questionnaire talks about, and yet tend to be left out or ignored within our general discussions of ACEs and how we react to them. Um, what are the other things? Yeah, because I know yeah. we've also talked a lot about how, so you have this ACEs study, right? And we're talking about how, this, how people are impacted by this trauma from their early childhood, but we're not always including the complex and severe traumas that have also impacted those things. Um, and then we've also worked with youth who, you know, we we give them the ACEs test to take, and then they say, but but what if I live with my auntie? What about you know my family member who died? Because there's actually I think death is not included in the ACEs study. So just kind of opening up some of those questions, and not to say. To completely dismiss ACEs, but just that there are a lot of other considerations that are worth keeping in mind with the individuals we're working with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I have an image here sort of representing uh, poverty and low income status because we know that even when there are no ACEs, like no uh, traumas within the home, to grow up in an environment where violence is always around you or to grow up with the constant strain of poverty is in and itself a trauma, right? And it has similar impacts on body and brain, not the same, but similar. Um, we also want to consider veterans, again, as we consider adults, if we have people who had complex trauma as children and then layered on top of that have discrete traumas that they experience as adults, such as you know, in, in their service, then we need to be aware of that in the adults that we're working with and the likelihood that, we, that people have PTSD from those discrete traumas being tied to their childhood histories. So we just, have, we just want to ask generally, like ourselves, as we're doing this work and as we're in the community, what counts as trauma? And who counts as our community? Um, so can we broaden that lens from, you know, young children with certain protective factors who have incidents that happen at home to account for the complexities that can go beyond that and the ways that this can impact us throughout the lifespan? Yeah, and also just to expand on, you know, the title of this slide, considering adults besides veterans. If you have someone who's grown into adulthood and there were not support systems or therapy in place to 
help them beyond, I mean, to the point they're at now, right? Um, we still have to ask these questions. We still have to consider that ACEs matters, even though they are over 18. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and this applies so much in our work, again, where even when we're not working in, in uh, settings that might traditionally be defined by this ACEs category, I guess, mm -hmm. we know that the impact is so far-reaching that we have to have that trauma-informed lens no matter who we're working with. Okay, now we're here to talk about music. <laughs> um, so our organization, we really believe that music has a unique capacity to help in healing trauma. Um, and I will just go over some very general things, just some general principles of things about trauma and things about music that guide some of our work. Um, so first, trauma disintegrates neural processes. So uh, re whether we have a discrete traumatic event or a complex trauma, it, we can have parts of our brain that when we are in like a flashback or a moment of fight or flight, those parts of our brain become disconnected from each other. And so music has the unique capacity because it's processed by the entire brain. We don't have like how we have an ocular center. We don't have like a music center of the brain. When we listen to music or actively make music, we have the brain stem is tracking the pulse. We have um, visual tracking that works for us for melodies. We have emotional responses to music. So it really integrates multiple layers um, on top of each other and can help us with that overall brain integration. Um, similarly, because we can activate both sides of the brain in music, we can use some specific techniques, which Cassie will show at least some of <laughs> in a minute, um, to, do, to use bilateral brain stimulation in a similar way to EMDR, where we can access both of those sides and help to reintegrate some of those things so that we don't get stuck in the past moment as traumas come up. Um, oh, stuck in the moment is the next one. Trauma <laughs> makes us stuck in the moment of a traumatic event. So we know that when people recall traumatic memories, especially when they access that fight or flight response, the part of our brain that tracks time and location, like where you are and what day it literally is right now, goes offline. So essentially it's, it's not working. Um, and that's why when people have flashbacks, it feels like truly being in that moment and not right here. But because music accesses our brain stem and rhythm forces our brain to sort of track what's coming next, we naturally predict what's coming and it sort of gently guides us back into the present moment. Even when, I have, some, have you all seen this image of the brain? Mm. No, okay, so if this is our, if this is your brain stem and this is like your amygdala and midbrain and emotions, and this is your like uh, cortex, yeah, <laughs> great. When we have a traumatic memory or a, uh, that makes us enter fight or flight, this cortex essentially splits off from the rest. So we're operating just from our midbrain and our brain stem in that moment. It's a very like, um, like instinctive response that we have, right? So uh, an example is that even if you have like a, a moment where there's like a stick or a rope on the ground and for a second you think it's a snake, you have that like, it's like just your emotions and then it takes a minute for your cortex to come back online and be like, oh, we're fine here. <laughs> <laughs> so these things happen sooner. And music is something that, can, that we can access just you know, through um, even the brain stem without having to sort of talk ourselves out of that traumatic moment. Um, sorry that these are hard to read on this format, but I'll just read them all up. Um, so the Broca's area, which is in charge of verbal processing, can shut down following a traumatic event, which results in alexithymia, meaning that you can't, you can't or it becomes difficult to put your feelings into words. Um, so isn't it interesting <laughs> that trauma makes us uniquely unable to describe what we feel? and the process of therapy tends to be like sitting with another person and being asked to put words to what you feel. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of times we can, you know, it can be really challenging to pro 
process those traumatic memories with words when one symptom of that trauma is that we lose our words. So music and other arts therapies can be uniquely helpful in giving us a way of processing but keeping that nonverbal component so that we don't have to have the words for it, we can have it as a visceral experience. And then finally, um, trauma is carried in the body as well as in the brain. Um, so again, when we have trauma, it's not that we necessarily can just use our words and tell ourselves what's rational and then it goes away. <laughs> we continue to be, activate, uh, to be impacted by it because it's held in our bodies as well as in our brains. And so music gives us that visceral approach, which allows us to access our body's healing capacity rather than sort of separating off from that embodied self. Yeah, and I think just to expand on that, um, this is because a lot of the work that we do is live music making. Mm -hmm. So it's this very physical involvement in the music process. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna talk about just a couple of general principles in music therapy that, uh, that we use, and then you'll get to play a little bit. <laughs> Um, one of our most basic principles that we're thinking about is entrainment. And so entrainment, very simply, is our natural tendency to match others. So the term entrainment, or this idea, actually originally comes from physics. It was coined by someone who noticed that, like, if you have a room full of clocks with pendulums, like in Geppetto's workshop in Pinocchio, they all match, right? They're all, like, flowing together. And so if you have, if you put things in a room long enough with a pulse, they're eventually going to all align to that pulse, even like on a physics level, right? Like clocks, not humans. And so from there, uh, entrainment applies beyond that into, you know, our natural tendency to, you know, when you hear a song, it's at about the tempo that you're walking, you suddenly feel yourself like <laughs> marching along to the beat. Um, or when we have a, a very basic beat, it draws us in, right? So it makes a, it's our tendency to align with others, specifically rhythmically. Another guiding principle of music therapy is the ISO principle. So the ISO principle, again, is really broadly applicable, and it generally says that if you can match someone and then gradually shift, they will shift with you. So it's very related to entrainment. It's sort of like harnessing the power of entrainment <laughs> for good. <laughs> so we can talk about this on a purely um, like physiological level. So. If you, um, if I were in a hospital and I was, and I saw someone who was panicking and their heart rate was at like 160, I could meet them at that heart rate with a, with a rhythm and then gradually shift to something lower. And you can actually watch that person's heart rate regulate in accordance with the tempo that you shift. So that's a, the physiological level, but then this also applies more emotionally as well. So. Some of you may have experienced something sad happening and you want to really like if you're really sad and someone plays a very like happy-go-lucky song for you you will not feel better probably <laughs> we what you what you tend to crave will be something that matches that feeling right that feels like validating within that and then from there you may be able to listen to something that feels a little less intense, right? Or that moves you toward a little bit of what you're trying to get to emotionally. Yeah, and I, I think you can think of it in the other way also. So mm -hmm. if you're you know, feeling very positive in the moment and you're now watching like a horror film, mm -hmm. some of that music coming in might be very startling and you know, especially uncomfortable if you're not ready to hear that. So yeah. it can go both ways. Yeah, it can I mean, help ease us into if we're if we're trying to do deep work rather than sort of walking into a therapist's office and like being like, tell me your worst memory. <laughs> the ISO principle can help us in that sense too. <laughs> Not that we don't want to be happy. <laughs> right. <laughs> cool. Okay. <laughs> Now's when we need
need volunteers. <laughs> Just remember that this is being live streamed, so you will be recorded. <laughs> but you will get to play a drum, <laughs> and it will be low pressure. So we need five people, hopefully. Yeah. Feel free to just come up and take a chair and take a drum. I'm going to sit on that end. <laughs> yeah, so um, as people are kind of coming up and filling in those chairs, I just wanted to take a moment to talk about light drumming. Um, so if we think about some of our very earliest experiences in utero, um, we are experiencing rhythm, right? We experience rhythm of the heartbeat, we're experiencing rhythms in the breath um, from our mothers, right? So um, with what B was talking about, when we're in that traumatic experience or we're having maybe an anxiety or stress-induced response to an experience, um, now we're caught in that brain stem. So if we can help, if we can help people to feel more safe and secure, we can use rhythm. Does this make sense? Sorry, my brain's getting off track now. <laughs> um, and then with the, we'll be talking more about kind of the bilateral, because that's not the first thing we're doing. But bilateral movement that helps us to integrate the right and left sides of the brain. So that can help us to better regulate our emotions. So these are all things that are integrated into the drumming. That's why, that's why drumming is so helpful. Um, just for full disclosure, um, what we're doing today, this is not how I would start my session. Um, normally we would start with some sort of check-in, especially if it's a group I've worked with for a while. We might have a little bit of a verbal check-in. Um, we might close our eyes and do a body check. Um, and then usually we might do some breathing and we will usually integrate the drum with the breathing. Um, so that creates this really natural transition into drumming. So now we're already feeling the contact with the drum and can center ourselves with what's about to happen. But <laughs> we're not doing those things today. But what we are going to do before this other more bilateral exercise is we are going to go back to kind of that consideration of the heartbeat. Um, so we're going to start with just our amazing musicians. Okay. If it's helpful, it's going to be kind of a 4 4 pattern, but we're going to start with just initial beat. And whenever you're comfortable, just join me. So if I'm counting up, numbers can just keep going, right? To infinity and beyond. But, if, but by bringing it back down, we're gonna hit zero. And so that's a good resting point. We're all here together, ready to stop. Also, I'm considering the pattern that we're playing. So when we're thinking about the repetitive rhythmic pattern that Bruce Perry talks about, I'm kind of keeping that in mind and I'm making sure that we're all here together and that we're keeping that consistent. There's that structure and that consistency, which can help us to feel safe and secure in this space together. So um, 
going back to the idea of the bilateral movement that helps helps us right with our emotional regulation and working both sides of the brain. Um, I'm going to play a rhythm for you and then we'll all be playing that together. Um, we will gradually be reducing, we'll be taking parts of the pattern away to form a smaller pattern. And where this is heading is once we have that smaller pattern, we're going to use that for an anchor. The idea being that then your client has something to walk away with that they can transfer out of the session. They can use that anchor if they're experiencing a traumatic, or a, they're feeling triggered. So um, first you can just listen, and then when you feel comfortable, you can try. transitioning to that until we're all there together okay and just remembering to breathe throughout I'm going to slow it down a little bit too okay short nugget we're going to use in, as an anchor. I forgot to mention, you can do this at your seat. <laughs> so if you want to, with this next part, to kind of practice it, we're moving to our legs now. So if everyone wants to kind of try that where you're sitting. Um, so let me mention that ideally, you could use this in one session. Ideally, you would repeat this over many sessions, right? So that then your client can become more comfortable and familiar with it. 
Um, if they want to talk about some things that have triggered them recently, you can have, have that come into the space and then practice this so that it can be easier for them to maybe apply it when they're out in daily life. Um, so we, we had this four beat pattern and now we have this smaller nugget. This is going to be our anchor. The idea being, yeah. I have a question. Uh, Absolutely. You, you may have explained this, but I've, there's an assumption here that uh, bilateral brain stimulation is better than non-bilateral. Mm. Could you explain why that is? A little bit. Yeah, so do you, <laughs> you can go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this is basically taking some principles of EMDR um, which is a trauma responsive therapy in which we can recall a traumatic event and have <clears throat> regular um, stimulation of each side of our body, right, bilateral. Mm -hmm. And that, that helps to integrate the brain so that rather than that traumatic memory staying something that comes up unexpectedly and randomly without a sense of time as like flashbacks or trigger responses. It's something that is integrated into the rest of our memories. So that type of stimulation helps us to integrate that memory and that response in with, you know, how our brain more typically stores uh, like regular non-trauma and, and also just to know, I think I was also thrown off by the better than because I'm gonna do a, something in a moment that's not even probably going to use the drums. So just to say that this isn't all that we do mm. and not everything we do is like bilaterally focused. Right. That's you, meant, you kind of alluded to what. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so yeah, we're gonna, just that shorter part that. And this being something that your client can then take out into daily life, and if they are feeling triggered, they've got this that they can just do on their body. Um, so we're going to keep it slow right now. Um, and we'll just repeat it. you could do standing in line at the store, right? You can do that wherever you are. So that's, that is, yeah, one example. And um, also I did want to note um, that this concept of creating that anchor through drumming, um, I got that from Stephen Betts at a trauma-informed training I took in March. So I did just want to state his name and share, share that also. What's his last name? Betts, B-E-T-Z. Um, great. Does it, so we can, oh wait, are we okay on time? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you're fine. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so, yeah, can we thank all of you <laughs> for like, you know, <laughs> and then I just wanted to offer other people the opportunity to participate in this next activity, if anyone's interested. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And this could be, yeah, um, three to four people. And just a reminder that this is being live streamed. I do also just want to acknowledge that too. Any takers? I can again. <laughs> yeah, if anyone's interested in coming back up again. Sorry, I just had you sit down, but I did want to give that opportunity for others. Are we drumming again? Because I'll, I'll take a break. Not drumming. Okay. Yes, we'll have other instruments.
Come on, Sarah. <laughs> okay, so um, is anyone having a strong feeling right now that you would like to move away from? <laughs> like in it, yeah? Okay, cool. So um, actually, let me explain what's going on. <laughs> um, thank you for your patience with me. Um, so this next activity is going to be a mood or emotion. Stop me on my phone a mood or emotion vectoring exercise. Um, so going back to that idea of the ISO principle that V was talking about, um, we are, the idea here is you're meeting the client where they are. So maybe they're feeling anxious, they're feeling stressed, they're feeling angry. We're starting there, and then we're going to gradually get to the state that they want to be in. Um, and so kind of like creating a gradient through music is what we're going to do. Um, and, yeah. and this is a, a helpful tool to give them that opportunity to be in a safe and contained environment to kind of experience and process those emotions so that then when they're triggered in daily life, they can apply this experience to that situation. So, yeah, can I add one? Thing? Yeah, please. Yeah, I think this is also, um, so we, we can think of this in terms of the ISO principle in shifting our, our feelings with some intention in the moment. Um, also, I think trauma can lead us to think about the world in certain ways where things are kind of black and white, um, safe, unsafe, great, or terrible. Um, so often when we are working with people who've experienced complex traumas, um, small things, seemingly small things, can garner really big reactions. And often when we talk, like I work with a lot of children, so if I'm talking to a kid about anger, they can identify a million times that they felt really, really mad, but they have a really hard time identifying a time when they felt just a little bit mad, right? it can quickly kind of blow up because we have that trigger response of our, our cortex going offline. And so this experience also helps us to identify that it's possible to feel anything between mad and happy, <laughs> you know? That it's not just flipping a switch. We, have, we can have gradual shifts of emotions. We can dip our toe into anger and actually come back out safely without that trigger response taking over us. with an emotion she's experienced right now, which is some stress and anxiety. So um, what I've had her do, I had a variety of instruments up here, and I just asked her to choose the instruments she feels like would best represent that anxiety to something more calm. And so what all of you will get to do is one of you, so probably if we're going in this order, you will have the instrument associated with, the most strongly with anxiety for Sarah. Um, so which one? I'm sorry. <laughs> so we'll give you that one, and then next. So Sarah's kind of getting to create her gradient here, right? From most anxious to more calm. <coughs> do I do just the four? Is that kind of what you identify? You said this one, right? Yeah. Cool. So um, how do you feel about like pointing to each person when we would like them to start. Does that sound good to you? Because um, I can do it for you, but you will have a greater experience through that emotion, through the emotional states of the instrument if you're the one pointing. Let me explain what's gonna happen. So you'll start, right? And you're playing. 
How would you describe it? And so then, what are your names? I'm sorry, Michelle. Michelle. Beth. Beth. Okay, so Michelle, you're going to <laughs> represent that here in a moment. Mm -hmm. And then Beth, whenever, do you feel comfortable pointing to each person? Okay, Beth, then when Sarah points to you, you'll kind of come in with her, but you're gonna be, so we're going anxious, less anxious, a little bit calm, so calm, okay? So this is kind of what we're working from. And so you're gonna st <laughs> still be anxious, but less, right? And then, Michelle, with it, you're gonna work to start matching Beth sound, and then you'll be matching. And then what was your name? Stacy. Stacy, cool. Um, and then Sarah, when you're ready, you point to Stacy. And then Stacy, you'll be playing a little calm. And then everyone will work to integrate your sound with Stacy. And then Sarah, when you're ready, you can just come in. And then everyone working to match Sarah's state of calm with her playing. Can everyone hear how Cassie just described that? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> may go a little differently. They might kind of rush and then they're not feeling calm at the end, but we can talk about that and we can go through it again or, you know, yeah, do it another time. So, thank you all. That's cool. Yeah.
facilitating are group experiences designed for individual trauma healing. So they were really focused on having those takeaway strategies where it's like, okay, you as one person can apply this, right? Mm -hmm. And on addressing the impact of trauma on an individual's brain, right? Functioning of the brain, and also in personal emotional regulation. Um, but like we said at the beginning, we have to acknowledge that that individual form of resilience, the, those having those skills and awarenesses for ourselves is one branch of what creates resilience, right? So for- Can I make one other note on that yeah. too? Yeah, and just to say that the two experiences we did today, um, those are things we've used um, with our PTSD support group. So um, this is a smaller group. Like some of our groups get quite large. This would not be so effective with such a large group, right? Mm -hmm. So um, this is something we've generally done with like four to six individuals, kind of like we had up there today. Mm -hmm. um, and also, these are individuals who know each other well. So when we're talking about that sense of entrainment, if we have a group of people that are maybe all dealing with some anxiety, we can maybe all benefit from this experience, even though today we're focusing on this individual mm -hmm. and supporting them. Yeah. We can, yeah, benefit both of those ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So then our other branch to that is that we need to have systemic tools for resilience. If we have all the personal skills in the world but everything around us is <laughs> isolating or attacking, it's very difficult to be resilient. <laughs> um, and so in acknowledging resilience, we're thinking about family support, community support, and then these broader inequities. Um, I'm gonna touch on that uh, just a little bit further in terms of theory. So I wanna refer to Bronfenbrenner's ecological systems theory. And this is something, this is a theory of child development, but again, that we can apply beyond childhood to what resilience looks like throughout the lifespan. So Bronfenbrenner basically said that we have layers of systems. We're sort of in these like uh, targets, I guess. <laughs> Uh, with different layers of systems that impact our individual well-being. So first we have just the individual, right? So if we were talking about a baby, let's talk about a baby. We have the individual baby, we can think about their health and their well-being kind of on its own terms. If we go one step beyond that, we're going to think about microsystems. So those are individual relationships that the baby has. So the main one is going to be a baby to a parent or caregiver, right? But there also may be, you know, for us, a child to their music therapist or a child to their community partner that's here at the ACES quarterly. <laughs> <laughs> so if you know children directly, that is one microsystem. And so we, you know, the health of that microsystem, of that two person system, will impact the individual health of both of those people. If we go out one more layer, we talk about mesosystems, meaning the relationship between microsystems. So a child might have a relationship between their mom, with their mom, and a relationship with their dad. And the relationship between mom and dad is really going to impact that child, right? So even uh, on the level where it's not touching the child per se, the interaction between those microsystems really affects that individual's well-being. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if we go one layer beyond that, we talk about exosystems. So this is where a lot of us come into play. So our local institutional supports. So if someone is accessing WIC for, to get their nutritional needs met, if they are coming to the music project to receive therapies, um, those are examples of part of that exosystem. That also can include their extended family, their workplace, neighborhood, and things like that. So people who you maybe don't see every day but who shape what your community looks like. And then finally we have the macro system. So that could be, we could think about the city of Everett, we could even think you know, of the United States or North America, or we could think globally. And the macro system is important because we know that there are global systemic inequities that impact the individual people that we work with. Does 
Does that make sense? Yeah. Great. Absolutely. So with that in mind, part of our work at the Music Project is to not just have individual people like, you know, suck it up and do really great in spite of everything, but to actually provide more resources so that individual community members have access to the things that will support them, right? So we don't have just traumas compounded by more traumas. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where um, we move from thinking in terms of clinical music therapy, that really skill development, individual lens, to community music therapy. Um, I'm gonna give some general principles of it and then Cassie will describe it a little bit more. So in community music therapy, our concept of health is not simply individual health because we know that well-being can be shaped by a, a myriad of factors like we just saw in that drawing of ecological systems. So as we think about well-being in community music therapy, we're really thinking about increasing possibilities for action. So by that definition, that could be about physical health that allows you to do things that you want to do, but it could also be about um, reducing barriers and discrimination that allow you to do the things you want to do. It could also be about forming relationships and connections with support systems that increase your possibilities for action. It could also be about having spaces for personal expression. So there's a really broad definition of what we mean by well-being in that sense with community music therapy. Um, another principle is that individual health is communal health. So if everyone around you is not doing well, you're not doing well, right? And you know, a, a principle of systems theory is that any one piece of that system is going to be impacted by the whole system, and the whole system is going to be impacted by each individual piece. So if we have a group that's just going really lovely and then I get triggered and have a big reaction to that, that is gonna shift what the dynamic of our whole experience is. And so community music therapy is all about that, like finding the health of the entire system, meaning everyone who's in the room with us and also the implications for the broader community around that. Um, so we really emphasize collaborative processes, uh, meaning that as opposed to the clinical things where the therapist really is holding certain types of expertise and knowledge and passing those on to people as tools, community music therapy really has a therapist as a participant um, who's you know, facilitating and collaborating with the people, the rest of the people in the group to make group decisions and to decide what our goals are and what we're trying to accomplish, how we're trying to get there, what music we want to play, and all of that. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's actually where I want to start. So, um, just to say, it, along the what Bee was just talking about, if you walk into a space that's oriented around a community experience with music therapy, um, the dynamics can look very different because we may have participants that are taking on different roles. And like you was saying, that therapist may be in more of a side-by-side -side role. Um, often times the therapist is maybe orienting themselves more as a coach or guide than I am the leader of the space. Um, and so, but the, the music therapist is still acting as that facilitator to keep that space feeling structured and comfortable with what is happening. Um, does this make sense so far with how that might look a little bit different? Um, the therapist is still, so they're still facilitating what's happening. They're also still considering goals for that group based on the participants' needs. So there's still kind of that clinical orientation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, as far as what is beneficial about community-oriented music therapy, um, it can help to support, like decrease feelings of isolation. Um, so we're increasing those social support systems, um, increasing our ability to communicate and negotiate with others, um, 
empowering others through the ability to take on some leadership skills, learn an instrument, which could also be a recreational or coping skill, right? Um, hmm. <laughs> there's so many, I mean, like you were saying, there's so many different things at play there. Um, I guess I could just go into some of our groups more specifically. <laughs> So what this looks like in some of our spaces, some of our groups, um, we have a jam group that is mostly veterans. Um, so when you walk into that space, we have electric guitars, bass, basses, um, drum sets, ukuleles, <laughs> a wide variety of instruments, and people are playing classic rock music predominantly. Um, but kind of like we were talking about, they're still negotiating with one another. We're working on tolerance for other musical preferences in that space, um, the way different people might want to play in the space. We have different skill levels happening, right? So we can also kind of learn from one another and work together. So all those things are happening there. Um, we have, <laughs> I guess, partnered with um, Volunteers of America, if anyone's familiar with that organization. Their Meaningful Day program, so it's predominantly focused on adults with developmental disabilities. Um, and it's a very kind of recreational focused program and they do a lot of community work by work taking um, the participants out into the community and also working on site. So my orientation in that space is um, focusing on how is everyone in this group making music together? So not just consideration for the client participants, but also the staff that are there and myself and how we are engaging with one another and making music together. So very much about that sense of community, right? Um, I can talk about community music therapy for a long time. <laughs> um, I think also we can extend it to spaces like our group music lessons. So you know, you walk in there and someone's calling me teacher, right? And they're talking about the skills that they're learning. But we're also focused on peer-to-peer -peer relationships, developing social skills. Um, feeling good about ourselves and being able to play the piano or guitar. Mm -hmm. So um, there's that self-esteem piece um, and that freedom to be able to express yourself um, through music and with your peers, creating, composing, all of these things. Yeah, yeah, I think that, that one is a really great example to me because when, like, the, the participants in that program are not referred for any, like, individual reason. It's open to participation with the knowledge that there's a lack of resources for families in this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And that when kids grow up in areas with lack of resources and with exposure to violence and with the stress of poverty, that it impacts their visions of what's possible for themselves. And so rather than taking individual children and saying to them like, hey, <laughs> you can do it, or like, just believe in yourself. We really find that, you know, we want to be adding resources to that community so that kids aren't left in that position so much. And music can be one branch of that. And music can also be tied to, like Cass is saying, these social and emotional components of having a sense of friendship and community where you live. Yeah, and also like you were saying, we are, you know, we're working with the participants. I'm not just coming in and observing, you know, how we just engage together and saying, hmm, this person needs to work on their speech skills and they need to work on, on this or that. We can actually talk, talk about these things and say, hey, what do you feel like you would like out of this? Um, it seems like everyone's looking for this. Can we accommodate that? Mm -hmm. Probably. Um, and then also when we're working with other organizations in site, that's part of that collaborative process too. So if I'm going to a new site, I'm talking to the staff there and getting their input besides the kids there because all of these perspectives are part of that community perspective and that community impact. Do the two of you play instruments and are you proficient or anything? Do you play with the groups? Yes, absolutely. And like that last experience we just did was actually exceptional because generally I would be involved in that process. Yeah, Not that's just watching. That's a nice general yeah. question. Maybe we so uh, we could describe what it, how you become a music therapist. <laughs> that would be helpful. So uh, to be a music therapist, you do a bachelor, a four-year degree program, 
um, in a music school. Um, so each of us at the music project has a primary instrument. Um, mine was violin. Abby plays saxophone. <laughs> we have other music therapists here, that's okay. <laughs> and then in addition to our primary instruments, um, through the music therapy uh, degree program, you become proficient in guitar, piano, voice, and percussion. Um, and so that gives us this somewhat adaptable skill set that we can draw upon to use different types of musics and different styles in different settings. Um, and then, yeah, the music therapy degree program covers the music aspects of that, but also sort of the basics of counseling and psychology, developmental processes, um, and things like that. And then at the close of that uh, degree program, there's a six month full-time internship. And at the close of that, there's a national board certification process. Oh so God. anyone, any music therapist, um, who works for us, or hopefully we see anywhere, mm -hmm. has gone through that process. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And much like you know, teachers or others that are in the space, you do continuing education all the time also. Yeah. That's required, yeah. Yes. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so we've given you a sense of some of what we do, and our hope is that we can now discuss a little bit of like what you can take away from this and applications that you can have. Um, so the question posed here is what is quote unquote good music? Um, and we're asking this because um, sometimes we experience assumptions that like, that are like, oh, you're a music therapist, so what's the best song for calming down? <laughs> and <laughs> there are sometimes some common threads of types of songs that often people find calming. <laughs> but what is really important for us as therapists is that music is a highly unique experience. Mm -hmm. And so anyone that we interact with has their own cultural implications that are tied up with music, their own specific memories where there's a certain song that makes Colby feel really happy and sentimental when he hears it, and it reminds me of like a very stressful moment in my life. <laughs> so often he will play it, and I'm like, I can't do that right now. Right, so we have specific moments that music can bring us back into. Um, and we have our own sort of emotional state. So like I was saying, if you're in a very sad space, something, a quote unquote happy song, that even you personally consider a happy song, isn't going to make you magically feel happy, right? So we have to keep these things in mind that whenever we're talking about good music, the function of music is personalized, it's communal, and it's contextual to that moment. Um, so yeah, that's sort of, I have personal associations versus universal truths. We have very few universal truths about music. Like entrainment exists, that's a great one, but <laughs> you can't really like prescribe and apply songs in that sense, right? Um, another thing to take away, I think, is that when, when you're thinking about like how music can play a role in the spaces where you work, um, one beautiful thing about music is that it can convey a sense of common purpose as opposed to common identity. Um, this is actually something taken from queer theory where we don't all have to have the same identities to be able to sort of unite around a common cause. And music is so complex that it can hold multiple cultural locations within one song. It can hold multiple ways of expressing like someone can be anxious and someone else can be calm and we can sort of coexist within that together and from there we can determine okay what is our purpose like Cassie was describing like what are our goals for this space do we want to perform a song do we want to feel calmer do we want to connect to each other and so we can unite around that um, and so I feel like this applies beyond the music therapy context in that when people share their musical preferences with us, that is an invitation for us 
or a choice for us to reject that and push away and separate ourselves from that or to invite that in, right? And if we can invite that in based on that common purpose, um, then we have a, a much greater likelihood of connecting with that person further. Um, okay, another thing to just think about coming out of this is that idea of having intentional progressions of music. So like how we talked about the ISO principle, that's something where we can be very specific and have very particular forms of expertise that we apply about it, but it's also something that can be broad, that you can consider broadly, um, that if you come across someone who is, you know, in a particular ne negative emotional state, sometimes there are opportunities when you can match that, right? When they can listen to something that for them matches that and you can help guide them through that process of regulating, even just through music listening. Um, and then, yeah, just a note on cultural implications of music. Again, with this sort of idea of good music, we all have our own cultural assumptions of what we like, what we believe to be good, what we believe to be like, quote unquote, real music. And we sort of need to interrogate those as we interact with people, um, especially for us as music therapists, but I actually think this is applicable for all of us, that if we have beliefs about the impact of an entire genre of music or an entire type of music, um, it's important that we ask ourselves where that's coming from and how that ties to the people and the identities uh, that are wrapped up into that music. Yeah, because to build on that, I, I think it's always really important to consider, you know, for this, let's say, teenager, the music they listen to is not necessarily just about them, but, you know, it might be about their friends, it might be about their family, it might be about what other people around them are listening to. So if you are condemning that music, then who, what else in their lives might you be, you know, negatively impacting their thoughts on you and what your relationship with them can be. Yeah, <laughs> let's talk. <laughs> I think we have about 15 minutes, so yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about how you work with uh, people who have dementia? Yeah, so the question is how we work with people with dementia. Um, we have several programs that happen. So one is the Memory Cafe that we described that is our community music therapy program where elders with dementia and their caregivers, so often their children or their spouses, um, come to the music home and eat a meal together and we have a music therapy session. So that involves singing and playing instruments and moving around and things like that. And those sessions are really targeted to support that connection between that person and their loved one. Um, because dementia can be a, a difficult experience for both of those parties. And having that moment to connect with each other can give a little bit of respite in that relationship and build it up. And also music is uniquely um, good at, <laughs> at um, supporting people with dementia because our familiar songs that we grew up with in adolescence are one of the last things, one of the last memories for us to lose um, as we age and especially with dementia. So it's like those songs like and like our names are <laughs> sort of the things that we hold on to. And um, you know, often you may have seen videos of people sort of in a certain state of not not having clear responses and then listening to a song and immediately kind of being like back in that moment, like I remember this thing, oh, this was such a, you know, nice time. So uh, music helps to facilitate that. So we have that session. We have a shared medical appointment session um, in partnership with the Everett Clinic, where similarly, elders with dementia come and their caregivers come. Um, at those sessions, we work with the elders specifically in the music group, and the caregivers have um, a support group separately and then come together at the end. And while all of that's happening, Every participant has um, a check-in with a primary care provider. Then, so it's a very collaborative joint effort. Yeah. yeah. 
And then third, we, we do some sessions in um, assisted living memory care facilities through the community. So, um, you know, prompting some of that, those same social engagements and quality of life things. those universals for like what's going to be good music. Yeah. 
for a lummy. Yeah, I don't think you yeah. can please everybody. Somebody might like elevator yeah. music, and somebody might be like, oh my god, it's elevator yeah. music. Right. Hi. Hey, we have a friend that runs the Recovery Cafe here in oh, yeah. Everett. It's like the one in Seattle where if you want to get off mm -hmm. drugs or alcohol yeah. and you're clean for a day and you want to start make, getting your life back, yeah. well, Wendy Grove runs that. And I wonder if, if uh, have you had any interaction with them? Yeah, some have they reached out to you? Connection with them? So we've at least had a participant who was also involved with them. You but do. that's a nice segue because, because yeah. we have our contact traumatized people. Yeah. Traumatized. So yeah. Traumatized. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, with any any connections that you are interested in making with us or for us, definitely reach out. So we have our phone number here. Okay. Um, we also have our website, scmusicproject.org. We recently moved locations, so we're at 1702 Pacific, right on the corner of Pacific and Wetmore. Um, and you can always email info at scmusicproject.org. So that, that gets you just sort of generally in to our system, so then we can make those connect connections with community partners, we can get individual referrals, any, any of the things you can yeah. get a hold of us. They just moved. They were at Broadway, then they were at the Catholic Church, oh. and now they're getting relocated down by the... In September, yeah. I just, it, I just was asked to uh, give music, music lessons, lessons there. Oh, cool. So oh, we're cool. giving individual music lessons on a variety of instruments, yeah. like piano, guitar, harmonica, whatever. Yeah. But it would be nice at a certain point when everyone has been desensitized. They're used to me being there. Mm -hmm. uh, to introduce some more uh, expansive projects with, I guess, help from you or some oh, other organization. Yeah. I think. Yes, I think. I think yes. <laughs> yeah. Reach out to us, and then we can, yeah, yeah like have those three conversations. Right. Yeah. Some people yeah. don't want to just focus on an instrument, yeah. but I think that this gradual That's introduction of the drums of different instruments can yeah. really help draw them in because they're just too afraid mm -hmm. yeah. to step out mm -hmm. at all. I can say I work with you at the at Shultis, my <laughs> kids are with your adaptive school program, and some of the kids I was teaching there, and I can say some of them were extremely traumatized, mm -hmm. and there's just a way where when you guys come into the room, and you start with just like little, like you said, gradually you give them mm -hmm. instruments, and let them kind of like feel it out and the whole vibe in the room you can just feel the empowerment you can feel just mm -hmm. their spirits literally raising it's just mm -hmm. you have to sit through one of the group sessions mm -hmm. to really experience it but mm -hmm. it's just something that it's a natural process that just kind of happens they're just so good at, they're so good at it mm -hmm. yeah. okay, thanks so we didn't even so <laughs>